Good evening, I'm Robert Svakarev. Since our lecture is going to be in English and there is no translation, so I will be doing my introduction in English as well. Do you translate in Hebrew or do you keep them in from what I mean. So, as you know, Dr. Van Salman is conducting for years the excavations uh, in, on the site of the old Great Vilna Synagogue. And he has a lot to say about the latest updates. And there is nothing uh, very much to speak for me. But I just want to take this opportunity uh, to make it a little bit uh, non traditional introduction. Because, well, uh, Great Vilna Synagogue is now is about science. Archaeology is very scientific, there's high technologies involved and, and <coughs> so on. But there's also, you know, uh, an enormous amount of tremendous amount of emotion I'd say about that. Because all recollections, past, sacred place, uh, and actually touching the past is always always emotional. And thanks to Rimantas, I have obtained today a poem written by Mark Chagall. It was a surprise for me that he was writing poems as well. And it's dedicated and it's called the Vilna Synagogue. So let me at first to do this introduction by reading this poem. Okay? So, <clears throat> the Vilna Synagogue, the old shul, the old street. I'm pain I painted them just yesteryear. Now smoke rises there and ash, and the parquet is lost. Where are you, Torah scrolls? The lamps, menorahs, candeliers, the air generations filled with their breath. It evaporated in the sky. Trembling, I put the color, the green color of the Ark of the Covenant. I bowed in tears, alone in the shoe, a last witness. So maybe he's not the last witness. Maybe it's coming back to future. So, but this is the start for the book. So now the floor is next. Uh, I will actually just add something about Mark Chagall because he's actually describing an actual event in this poem. I didn't know the poem. But he's describing an actual event because he came here in the 1920s to paint and, and, he, uh, and he painted the Great Synagogue. Uh, and the only pictures we have of color of the Great Synagogue are Mark Chagall's pictures. So his pictures, uh, which is it's shown in the, in the museum, they have a, uh, not the original unfortunately, but they have, the, uh, but they have a copy of one of, of the Mark Chagall picture which he painted inside the Great Synagogue. And the color that he gives to that, we would have to be careful with Mark Chagall because Mark Chagall is, as you know, is a, is a colorist. And Mark Chagall's, um, anything that involves things that involve color and fantasy is where Mark Chagall takes his, uh, takes his, uh, uh, takes his, his points of view in his paintings. So I, when I looked at his painting of in the inside of the Great Synagogue, I was very uh, worried that the colors that he gave of the, of the Great Synagogue, which he described in his poem, are not actually the real colors. But uh, luckily, the one thing that does survive of the Great Ark, actually one of two things, we have the doors of the Ark, and we have the shield, which is uh, also displayed in the, in the Gore Museum. And the Gore Museum has colors of red and blue of the, uh, of the uh, shield on the ark. And that's exactly as he paints it. So we would like to suggest that maybe not only is the uh, other, not only is the shield the correct colors, but also the rest of the painting is also the correct colors. And this is, in fact, maybe one of Chagall's only documentary paintings rather than a fantasy, like he usually paints. Okay, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to be talking about the excavation. I'm going to take it as a given that you all know the history of the building, which I know is not necessarily true, but uh, we could give a whole lecture on the history of the building, um, but that would take up the whole of the evening. I'm going to talk about the archaeology on one hand, and the second the thing I'll be talking about is a little bit about the vision about how maybe we should see the building in the future. So these are the two things I'm going to be talking about. Just to satisfy those who may not have done their homework before the lecture, uh, we just say just a few words uh, about, about the Great Synagogue. It was originally built probably around about 1573. Uh, but that building was a, was a, was a um, wooden building, 
And later on, it was after a number of burnings and firing, etc., uh, it was eventually built in brick. They usually say in the books, in stone, but of course, as we know, the stone in, uh, in, in Vilnius is not really stone, it's all brick covered in plaster. So uh, this, is what the, uh, this is what it is. It's a brick building that was built later on. And, and it was called a number of names, but mostly in Yiddish it would have been called the Stotschul. In other words, the city shul. You know, it's a great shul in any of the, of the other languages, but the, but, the people, but the Jews of the city refer to it as the Stotschul, the city synagogue. Around it were 12 prayer halls, which we'll see later in the year. 12 small prayer halls, uh, 12 of 160 synagogues, which stood in the city up until 1939. Uh, and they were a mixture of Kloisen and Stiblach, which are Yiddish words, which relate to the tradition that each kind of prayer hall belongs to. So if the, if the prayer hall was a long to the Litvak tradition, or we call the Mitnaget tradition, the, op the opposition tradition, then it would be a Klois. It, would, it sounds like it's Yiddish, but in fact comes from the Latin word cloister. And the other, and the other word is Stiblach. Stiblach is the prayer hall of the Hasidic tradition. So and in the, I must remind you that in Lithuania, the Hasidic tradition was never strong. It was always second in line. Uh, and uh, even though one of the biggest uh, Hasidic schools, the Chabad, had its origins in the, in the greater Litvak, in the greater Lithuanian world, this was the area of the... Uh, of the of the cloys, not of the shtibli. So we had that inside the shulvot. We also had other communal institutions. We would have had the administration of the Jewish community, especially up until the time you could say of Napoleon, at least. Uh, we would have had a, a small prison because Jews had internal autonomy. In other words, the autonomy of the community was uh, was uh, involved people uh, law between of cases between Jews was in, was was done internally. So there was a small prison. I wouldn't say it was for murder, but it was certainly for uh, not divorcing your wife or something like that. And the other thing is that when you go around the city and you listen to the tour guides, they will always tell you about the 3,000 people who would have been sitting inside the building. Well, we believe there are only about 450 people who could have sat in this building. Uh, the size of the structure is one thing, but the other thing is you can actually count the seats. So uh, we can, and we have. So uh, that's, a, that's, the number of, that's the number of people who would have been in the, in the Great Synagogue. Too small for a community of uh, 50, 60,000 people. Yes, but you must remember there are another 159 other synagogues in the city where they can go to. The ones that are religious, of course. Uh, worth noting, of course, that this is a great center of Torah study. Now, the Torah study did not necessarily take place in the great synagogue, especially in the winter, uh, where it was particularly cold. But in the small prayer halls around, that was where the Torah study would have taken place. The Gaon, the famous Gaon of, of, of Vilna, who, is, um, who of course lived, again according to the tour guides, in the house that's next to the synagogue, um, we know did establish a prayer hall within the complex of the Shulhoif, uh, which is on the, uh, on the side of, of uh, Jidu Gatve, uh, which is right at the entrance to the Shulhoif, where he established a, uh, a prayer hall, which of course carried on later after his life. He refused the position of, great, of, of, of the chief rabbi of the city. He viewed the idea of having to deal with the general public as something that is a waste of time. So uh, he would have been very much interested in, in his own prayer study and the study of uh, the teaching of the best students. So that's, what, that's what, who he would have been teaching. He's the best students which he chose himself inside the Bet Midrash, the, the uh, seminary, which was right at the entrance of the the building itself, and we'll see it a bit later, is a, uh, well, we'll see that a bit later, what it looks like, so I'll talk about that. Um, worth saying just a note about the disappearance of the building before we get on to what it looked like. The building at the end of the uh, Nazi period uh, was still standing. It was burnt, it was ransacked, and in fact, initially had a, uh, a conservation order placed on it by the, uh, by the new Soviet government. In 1955, the conservation order was rescinded, was taken away, and the uh, building was destroyed, was knocked down together with a whole section of the, of, uh, a whole section of the Schulhoi. At that point, it was possible to repair the building, but unfortunately, as you know, it was destroyed completely, and the uh, school, which was uh, there until last summer, uh, now it's just the building, uh, now covers a great deal of the symbol. Just to give an idea of the, of the different buildings, you can see number one over here 
is the uh, Great Synagogue itself at the centre. Uh, you can see number 13, which we're going to be looking at a bit later, is the bathhouse with the, uh, the mikveh, which is another major part of the structure. Number, uh, this one right here at the front, the toys of the Vilna the on, right at the very, very front. And various other structures you can see. You can also see Vokichu Street today, which is today here, well, sorry, it was there, and today is, stands around about here. So the whole of this part is completely lost underneath the, the apartments, which now line the side of Bokichu Avenue Street. So you can't, uh, they will not be excavatable in the future. But certainly, the greater part of the, the synagogue, the Strachan Library, the bathhouse, and at least this part of the of the Gaona, of the Gaona uh, cloys will be a, is, will be available. Another thing we should note is the line of Jidugate, which today goes in a pathway like this. And it used to go this way. So the Strachan Library, for example, the famous library of Rabbinical Library, is today under the street. It's not, uh, not on the line of the present uh, street at all. It's underneath the street. And you can see over here a picture from the 20th century. First of all, you can see the number of seats. I think you would agree with me that we don't have 3,000 seats in there. Um, but you're, that's, that's you can see the seats inside. You can see at the back the stairs coming down. And one of the major features of the, script of the Great Synagogue, of course, was the fact that it was below street level. And that, uh, so the fact it was below street level was due to the idea that you could create internal height uh, of the building by dropping the floor level, because the building itself could not be higher than the churches. So it had to be lower than the, lower than the to, to low, by lowering the floor, you could create the internal height which would create internal grandeur. So that's the idea of dropping the floor level. You can see it would come through the door, and then you would go down the steps to the floor level of the Great Synagogue. You can see behind that, at the back, you can see uh, the, the annexes, which were built in the 18th century. Uh, they were built in the 18th century, originally as uh, Israq Nashim, as a place for the, for the women. Uh, later on, there, that was changed, and the room was moved upstairs. Uh, but uh, in, the, in the initial phases, that would have been uh, the women's section at the back. Over there. You can also see over here the Strachan Synagogue opened up in 1902. Uh, on the top part, uh, the, on the top part, the library, the library hall. On the bottom part, a very strange combination: meat stalls and a library together. That's the, uh, the way it was done, and the reason it was done this way was because uh, these were kosher meat stalls, and the control of the kosher meat market was one of the central aspects uh, of of money generation for the community, for the rabbinical community. Um, it, was, it was through the it was through kosher meat. This is a uh, a plan which was done by uh, Leonid Dino in, in 1893 when there were repairs that were made. And the thing that surprises me time after time is coming across these plans in the city archives. Uh, um, and these are, are these are building plans, building repair plans. They're completely modern in, in concept, and uh, they give us very very important information. On the other hand, these are plans. These aren't documentation. In other words, this is, <laughs> this is do not documentation. This is not, this, is not, this is an idea what you're going to do in the future in 1893, but in the future from 1893. So what we find in these plans is not necessarily what we find in the field. we have got to be very careful with them. But they give us very important information anyhow. I would like you to, I would like you to uh, first of all, note how the street, the floor, the ground level, and the, and the staircase. You can see it very, very clearly over there. Again, over here, how it's going. You go down into the synagogue. Also worth noting is that the synagogue has like um, a double, double wall. You can see in the centre we have the square wall with the bima at the centre. Actually, that's up. I'll do this one here. The square wall with the uh, bima at the centre and the uh, the Aaron College at the back. And then around it, we have the annexes. This annex over here, so the original building, probably 7th century. As far as we can assess, this annex is probably 18th century. That is, again, one of the things that archaeology has the possibility, we hope, to give answers to. We don't have total documentation about this. We know about this to some extent from the historical sources. But again, archaeology is the sort of tool that does give the, the sort of information which is chronological and may give us the answer to that sort of question we have as well. The other section over here, which is called the Polish, which, which, which was part of you know, Leonid Vilna's plan. So this is what he was adding on in this building plan at the time. This is, the, uh, this is, this is a picture, I can tell you the date of this picture. 
This picture is 10th of July, 1944. So this is uh, during the battle for the city. Uh, we can see uh, it's a German Luftwaffe picture, which was part of a whole collection of uh, Luftwaffe pictures which were captured um, by the Americans and by the British. Uh, they were later placed in the, they were later made classified. They were secret documents right to the end of the Cold War because these were the best images of the Soviet Union that the, uh, the Americans and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the British had until the modern satellites. So these were actually secret documents right up until 1990. They are fantastic information. This was taken as an intelligence photograph during the Battle for Vilnius. And we can see uh, on the 10th of July, we can see uh, the, the area of the Jewish quarter of the, of the, of the Jewish court, so the two ghettos. Uh, number A is where the Great Synagogue is located. Uh, underneath the smoke, uh, and you can see it rising up from the city. Uh, and you can see afterwards the results of that day of firing uh, very, very clearly. You can also see that the Great Synagogue is still complete. That's A. You can see B, where the bathhouse is. You can see that these buildings have no roofs because they will be burnt. But you can see that many, many of the buildings which didn't even survive later have, have still got their roofs intact at this time during the battle itself. And after the war, well, after the war, the building looked like this. You can see the structure itself. The structure is damaged, badly damaged, but still basically sound and basically in a situation where it can be uh, restored at this time. But unfortunately, it was not. This, by the way, is the uh, the Goons Cloys. The Goons Cloys at the bottom, which was also in a complete situation at that time. Afterwards, the uh, plan of 955 was to widen the street. This part of the uh, this part of the of the Schulhof was covered by the buildings you see today. This part was covered by the road. And all we have today is this area right here of the of the Schulhof. You can see the building as well and the school that was built on the site later. Now um, I won't be too, so don't be too worried. <laughs> um, archaeology as a tool is a, is a tool which looks at the physicality of buildings. It looks at the at the way that they change physically. We look at the historical documents, we use them of course, but we're trying to use our tools, our methodologies, to try and understand the historical processes or the archaeological processes of the building uh, as they change in time. Uh, I'm not an historian, I'm an archaeologist, so I sat down with, uh, with Vladimir Levine of the Hebrew University, who wrote the uh, very impressive chapter on uh, the synagogues of Lithuania. Uh, well, actually, he didn't write the whole book. He wrote large sections of the book, but he did write the chapter on Vilnius. And the chapter on Vilnius, which is, is I would consider, the, the seminal chapter on, uh, on synagogues of the city. Uh, and so I sat down with him to say, well, okay, you have your historical sources. I'm not going to improve what you're going to do on that in, that, in that way, especially as I have a language barrier. Uh, what I can do is I can see how archaeological tools can then supply the sort of information to questions which you don't have answers to. So we were looking, for example, about whether or not we can uh, get any idea about the initial construction of the building, whether various stages of um, building and development uh, are represented in the archaeological record, um, uh, get, to get an idea about the development of the building. For example, I showed you before how the building had originally had this square structure in the center and had annexes. Are we able to show that archaeologically? So these are the sorts of questions which we're asking during the work. We're also asking questions about the uh, the cloisters, the various prayer halls around it. We have, uh, for example, the old cloisters by tradition. It had a sign in, in, in Polish right up until the war that said uh, this was built in 1440. Well, I don't believe a word of that. I don't know if the building was. There was a building that was built in 1440. Uh, maybe the archaeology can uh, give some information about that. And by the way, that building was set above the famous uh, double arch with the clocks, if you if you know what I'm talking about at the entrance, which gave the prayer times. I don't think the building is that that day. Maybe archaeology will give that sort of answer. So we have other, other questions, again, about different uh, parts of the building in, in question number three. And the fourth question, which we were going to ask, was about, uh, about water. Now, the Jewish community had been given uh, rights to receive water from the municipality. The, the community was never supplied the water it was meant to be given, and had to rely on itself to give the water, to get the water. The water they decided eventually to buy from the Vingrio Spring, and if you don't know where that is, that's right up by the museum, the Jewish Museum. Uh, and it belonged to the Dominican church, which is across the street 
from the, uh, from the synagogue. Um, and the water was then brought to the brought into the uh, brought towards the, the synagogue area, which would be used for drinking, bathing, and of course for the mikvot. So this is where this is the uh, uh, this is what we knew from the records. With the uh, we're trying to see within the archaeological record, are we able to use archaeology here to find any information about that? And I will show you that we that we can. Okay, so far we as I said uh, we noticed before we are now in our sort of three and a half four season. Uh, these are the various seasons of work we've been doing so far. In 2011, the first excavation, I was not involved in that excavation. Uh, Zonamus Bolbanis, uh, we did that excavation as part of the pre-planning phase of, uh, the of, for the memorial building at the, at the site, something which stalled at that point. And in, in 2015, uh, I came in and we decided to do a ground penetrating radar survey. Uh, and then to conduct a series of excavations uh, in love two years ago, 16, 17, and again 18, which is marked in the red, in the red areas. This was what we planned before, but Justine, as my colleague, was sitting over here at the back, can tell you um, that's not what we did. <laughs> Just like the plans of Vilna, uh, of Vilna before, we, we, we looked at the plan and said, okay, we're going to do a bit more than that. So we've been doing a whole great deal more than that. The, the agenda, or the plan that was given to us by, the, uh, by our um, our donors, the Goodwill Foundation, and by the Jewish community, uh, was to find the outline of the building. So we've done that, but we've done more than that. And we'll, we'll show you that. And the first thing I'm talking to talk about is about the mikveh. Um, I've shown this to some extent, I think, in a previous lecture last year, so I won't go through it all. But I will say uh, the study of, of, of the mikveh, of the ritual bath, is one of the central aspects of archaeological work of what we could call Jewish archaeology. Um, there are very few things you could say are, are type fossils. Something you could say, I'm touching the site and this is a Jewish site. What does that mean? Everybody uses a plate. Everybody sleeps in a room. Everybody uses a book. It doesn't make it particularly, uh, it doesn't, it's not an ethnic indicator. So what is an ethnic indicator? Uh, there are various things which are associated with particular kinds of peoples. And one of the few things that are associated with, uh, with, with that you could say, when I see this, I know I'm dealing with, with the Jewish population is the mikveh. And this has been found already in archaeology since, uh, since the uh, Second Temple period. Uh, we have, uh, these, are, these are from Jerusalem, these are from the time of the destruction of the temple. This in fact is right next to the Temple Mount. So these are the kind of mikveh that we find uh, in the area of Jerusalem and in Qumran and other places. Uh, as we will see, it doesn't change a great deal over 2,000 years. If we move into, uh, into Europe, we can say archaeologically we have uh, we have a mikveh in um, in archaeological contexts since the Middle Ages, since the early Middle Ages, I would say probably since the 10th century. Places like uh, Speyer and Köln and um, where else we got over here? Gorlitz. Uh, these these are mikveh from from that time, and these are using groundwater. Now, to make a mikveh kosher, the water in it has to be what's called we call living water. Living water can be seawater, which is not too appropriate to Vilna, to Vilnius. Uh, we can use uh, the we can use a river. You can bathe in a river. You can use groundwater like an uh, aquifer, or you could use uh, spring water. What you can't use is water that you draw draw up from a well, or you can't uh, bring it through a pipe. But uh, anybody who has anything to do with with Talmudic studies will know that the whole idea of Talmudic studies is to find ways to get round things. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is what has happened over here. Um, there is no spring, as I'll, see, I'll show, you before, show you in a moment, is not next to the synagogue. So we have to see then how do we get round the problem. In this case, we're talking about groundwater. This is the aquifer. The idea is you build a large staircase into the ground until you hit the aquifer, and then you bathe in the water of the aquifer. And again, other places in Europe, for example, uh, Amsterdam, Besalou, which, uh, which is a good place because it's next to Barcelona, so anything is good in Spain. Uh, so, and Syracuse, of course, is in Sicily. So these are nice places to be as well. Uh, again, the water is groundwater. No, actually, it's not. Uh, Besalou is river water. It's right next to the river, and it goes into the river. So it's at, that's in, the, uh, in Spain. And we have, then, we have, then we turn to the Pale of Settlement. There's been a lot of work on the mikvot in, in Germany, a lot of work on the mikvot in, uh, in Sfarad, in Spain. Not so much work has been done on the work in, um, in, in the Pale of Settlement. We can see a number of structures over here which, uh, which are mikvot in the, uh, in the area of Lithuania, 
that's Romania, Kretinga, this is Ukraine, uh, Kretinga because my grandmother comes from there, not that you can see anything, but th those sort of places which you, uh, which you can see over there. How do these places work? Well, first of all, that's now, this is the synagogue, this is the Nikta, by the river. So the water is flowing through the building, that's the way it's working over there. So we have to see exactly how, uh, what, uh, so we see that's the way that it's working from the very limited knowledge we see in general. Generally, the mikveh is located by the river. That's the most, that's in many, many cases. Um, we can see, but it's not the case over here. What do we know about the mikveh? Uh, go back to the history books. We have a very important book that was published in Hebrew here in the city in 1934 by a man called, by a researcher, by a man called Israel Klausner. Esau Klausner is a modern researcher in every way, and the important thing about his book, <coughs> the important thing about his book is that he had access to the uh, records of the Jewish community before they were destroyed in the, during the Second World War. So he had access, and his book gives detailed information, much of it very, very boring, about the, uh, about, about the running of the Jewish community. He has one chapter, which should be the most boring chapter of all, which is called the Maintenance Department, <laughs> which is called Bedik Bay, which is, the, which is actually a biblical phrase, Bedik Bay was who was involved with the, with, the, uh, with the maintenance of the temple. And uh, so he talks about exactly how the water comes to the, uh, comes to the, to the, syn to the synagogue. He notes that the water is bought 200 gold pieces from the, uh, by the, from the Dominican friars. Uh, that they're allowed to con channel the water directly to the Schulhof itself, and only to the Schulhof. That they are allowed to, um, uh, they're allowed to make extra pipes into the houses. Um, he talks then about the list of payments, and he has even the payment of how much the Gaon paid for his water and refuse collection and for sewage collection, uh, and how much the German priest on the other side of the street paid the Jewish community to have his water taken out, water brought in, and have his refuse taken out. It's all listed over there inside the book. Um, and it goes on to explain uh, how, how exactly that happened over a number of centuries and the various repairs and how it was transferred to various people and they charged money for the bath and they didn't charge money and then it was broken. So it's a whole series of issues going on. By the, 20, the end of the 19th century, the bathhouse and the mikvah are out of repair and they're impossible to use and they uh, get a donation of $20,000 from the joint. But by 39, it's closed again. And there is no plan, the plan, and the plans to reopen never happen. That building is closed before the shore. And to give an idea of what the building was like inside, I think it's rather amusing thing from a Yiddish guidebook to Vilna, published in 1939. And the, the, the steps were slippery, and frequently people slipped and were injured. The cool bath house, where people bath, had a pump at the center. The two Gentiles always stood above and pumped up and down water. The water was black as coal. Cubicles of changing room were infested with cockroaches. From the corners of the bathhouse could be heard the croaks of frogs. From their hiding place could be hear the chirps of grasshoppers. So I don't think that it was a greatly, um, I don't know, maybe it wasn't, you, purification and cleanliness are different kind of things. So uh, it's a different, uh, that's <laughs> what it was. <laughs> After the mikvah, you did the good bath. <laughs> Anyhow, the Vigrio Spring, uh, is located right here. This is Pelimo Street over here. The Bingo Spring is here. It still now looks like this. That's what it looks like today. Maybe in the future, when we finish excavating the um, when we finish excavating the uh, the Schulhof, we can come and excavate the uh, Bingo Spring. Uh, the kind of pipes that would have led the water from the Bingo Spring to the bathhouse would have been these. Um, you can see pipes like that, for example, in the exposition in the uh, in that palace of the Grand Duchy. <coughs> Uh, wooden wooden pipes, which had a, uh, a couplet in metal, which will put one into the other. I imagine it would leak a bit, but uh, that's how the water was brought in from there to there. And some of those, I understand, are found quite regularly during excavations in streets around the old city of uh, the old city of uh, Vilnius. The first excavation in 2011 uncovered three parts. There were three sections. One was at the very front where the part of the ark was covered, was uncovered, and it went all the way back and said, uncovered part of one of the columns. Uh, then there was another excavation which was done in this section to uncover the area of the steps. And the third one was on the area of the, uh, the corner of the building, 
Uh, remember this because we're going to come back to this when we talk about what we've been doing in the last few years. Uh, that excavation by uh, by Zenonas uh, Volcones really uh, was the was the opening uh, salvo of this excavation, and it provided very important information about positioning of the building, about the various levels of the building, uh, and it was very much helpful for us in the in the, in the continuation. So there you can see the various areas within the synagogue. The uh, steps, the arc, the area of the uh, area of the uh, of the Duma, and one corner. And there you can see. Remember this as well. We're going to get back to that later. That, that particular column over there. That, that column is one of these. Okay. In 2016, we did the first season. <coughs> we didn't quite understand what we were doing. We sort of aimed at places that the uh, ground penetration radar had identified as places of potential. Um, we then found out during, late, during the later excavation that we'd uh, hit part, in part the bathhouse and in part the excavation was in the neighbor's house. We'd kind of got sh overshot. Um, we found we'd gone to an area which was outside the area of the, of the great synagogue, but that's what happens in archaeology. You try and error, and then eventually you find where you are. We also found that underneath the area of the, of the bathhouse were vaults. The whole area is covered in vaults, and they, uh, that is something which is, a con which is a contribution of this year's excavation, is that we now understand that underneath the whole of the area of the bathhouse, there are underground vaults. Any of you eaten any of the restaurants in the area of the old town know that they're good places for, um, for tables and restaurants, but in the past they would have been mostly uh, cellars storerooms and just empty spaces, but this is, this is what we find underneath the bathhouse as well. And then we were helped along by another discovery. We saw before the plan for the uh, extension of the synagogue. This is the plan for the bathhouse. I think we were found it in one of the uh, archives here in the city. A uh, plan from uh, 1874 uh, for the repair of the bathhouse. It gives very important information about the bathhouse. And what it does show is two places on the map on the plan, one is this one over here, and the other one is this one over here, where you can see what looks like square spaces with, I don't know if it's the resolution is that great, but there is like something in the corner, can everybody see that? If not, then I'll tell you that's one in the corner. But that looks like steps. So we, start, we thought that, that these, these two installations, this one over here, number 16 and number 9, would be our uh, book. In the following season, we used this plan as a guide. So we thought, okay, if that's what's shown on the plan, let's now use this plan to go and look in the field and find, find the mikvot. And luckily we did. So uh, the season, uh, this is the continuation of the plan, it's the way the building looked like. The season after that, in building number nine, we found this structure over here. This mikvot, uh, which you can see over there, you can see the steps coming down, you can see the area of bathing, you can see the drain, you can see the tiling, it's not greatly beautiful. This is the, uh, I remind you, this is the repair of the mikvot in, um, she's skewed. <laughs> That's something more interesting to do. Uh, um, this is the repair in, uh, in, uh, that was done with the money from the joint. So it's in fact it has a concrete outline. It has tiling which looks completely modern because it is. But it's in a framework which is of an earlier period. And this year we completed the excavation of the mikvot. This is the mikvot of room 16, uh, which you can see over here. Again, coming down the steps, going into the immersion area, and something very, very strange, which we don't understand, but anybody who can give me a, a solution to this problem is welcome to do so. Uh, usually, the otsal, that's the reservoir where the water comes in, is at the side of the mikveh, and it would flow over the top to come into the, uh, into the mikveh. Over here, the otsal is inside the immersion area, making the immersion area extremely small. I don't understand it, so I'll, I'll be welcome to any suggestions. Just to understand how our rabbinic authorities got past the problem of putting the pipe water into the mikveh, this is the way it was done. Water would come from the Vingara Spring, it would go into what's called a seeding pool or not sour, it would flow through that, flow over the top, and then flow into the immersion bath. This way, the pipe is open at both ends, in, in halachic theory, <coughs> open at both ends, and therefore, this is not flowing in a closed vessel, which you can't do. So this is the halachic way of getting around the problem. It goes in an open pipe on one side, goes through an open pipe on the other side, and this way it gets around the halachic problem of not being in a closed vessel, which would make it not kosher. 
you didn't understand that, that's okay. <laughs> okay, 2018, our excavation this year. We were going to uh, looking, we were looking at the area that we did before. We received the plan of the school, which is now empty, thankfully, and also the plan of the previous season in 2011, with the areas that were experienced in 2011, put one on top of the other. Our problem is that we're not totally certain that the scales are the same. We're not totally certain that the positions are the same. We have to take that as a sort of, a, as a guesswork. Uh, we have to be careful with that, but that's something we have to deal with. It's the best we have. And the idea, again, is the, how can the archaeology improve that understanding of whether or not the, the, uh, the uh, we're not the plan underneath is what represents it on top. When we talk about the next stage, what happens with the building in the future, we will need to know very much where every element is underground. So this year we're going to excavate of the, of the, of the, uh, we talked, uh, of the uh, Great Synagogue, we're going to do a, um, going to emphasize three areas. One was finding the, uh, it's meant to be one of the 11, but it's a matter, uh, the area on the corner uh, at the top over there. The other one is to find the edge of this this area down here, and the third one is to see what we could what we could do of the bima. Those are the three areas we're going to concentrate upon. So outside, we excavated an area which is this. This is the uh, the wall, the back wall of the great synagogue. I'll go back again one stage up. Again, you can see the uh, the diagonal. You can see the diagonal over there, which is the corner. That is the same diagonal which we have over here, very very clearly. The wall is 1.5 centimeters wide. <coughs> which makes the scale of the plan I showed before to you incorrect. Uh, beyond that, you can see the pathway, the pathway that goes between the great synagogue and the bathhouse. So this is what we found over here. Again, the floor is two meters below the ground level. So this guy who's meant to be working over here is, uh, is, is in the area which is below the level of the street and above the floor level, which we then found later. So you can see the work down over there, it's important to identify this particular work area. Now we call this the back wall of the synagogue. The synagogue of Vilna was a strange structure when it came to the directions. Usually when you go into a synagogue, or a church for that matter, you would come in through the facade, you then walk through the prayer hall, and the Aron Kodesh, or the altar, would be at the far side of the building. Here everything is twisted around. The Aron Kodesh is on the main street, it becomes the facade, the entrance, the entrance is at the side, and the wall at the back, which should be the facade, is blank. So it's a very strange building in every way that it works uh, in, in relation to most other synagogues. But that's the way it works, that maybe that makes it special. The other area was the area which you can see over here. We wanted to excavate this area over here in the corner to identify the corner. We identified, uh, it's a bit difficult to see, it's, in very, it's right up against the building in a very deep pit. But you can see the floor of the great synagogue, you can also see one and two steps. Can you see that? That's these steps. One and two steps. Those are the two steps that go down into the Great Synagogue Prayer Hall, which we found in that particular area. The third thing was the area of the Bima. Now, the area of the Bima was built in the 18th century after the burning of the building. In 1748. And it was built by the Assort, excuse me, who are, which is an acronym for Yehuda. Safra Dayana, Dayana, which is uh, one of the most important benefactors of the community. He provided for many of the cloisons. He provided for the day-to-day uh, -day life of many of the uh, important yeshiva students. Uh, he was a very important character. He also influenced who would be the chief rabbi of the city. And after he placed his son-in-law in the position of the chief rabbi, and the rest of the community didn't like it, and he passed away, they decided to prevent anybody ever in the future influencing who would be the chief rabbi. They put a big rock on the seat of the chief rabbi, and the chief rabbi of the city was only re-elected then later in the 19th century. So they, for a long time, there was no chief rabbi because the sorts of the sort of influence on, on community life. He provided funds for their own Kodesh, and also built the Bima, which was a, a Baroque structure, uh, usually identified has been built by uh, Glaubitz, though I don't think there is any documentation which proves it was built by Glaubitz. Um, and uh, it was a broad structure with Corinthian <coughs> columns with lions facing the Iran Kodesh. And there you can see what it looked like uh, in the past. Now, in most of the synagogues, most of the big synagogues in, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, 
what, are they what we call a nine bay synagogue. That means it has nine areas with the central, four central columns which hold up the ceiling. Usually the bima is attached within, that, within those four columns. Here they call, the bima is an independent structure and sat, stands between the columns. Can you see that? It's different to what many of the many of the uh, and many of the other synagogues, probably because the, the building was larger than most synagogues. And the, and the Bima is, is the central basic significance. If the uh, great synagogue of, of Vilna was the most important synagogue in the city, the most important synagogue in, in Lithuania, and was a symbol of the Jews of, the, of the, not only of, of Vilna, but also of Lithuania in total, this was very much a place of cultural significance. Uh, when the president of, 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 of Poland arrives here in June 1930, he speaks in two places. He speaks on the uh, altar of the cathedral, and he speaks from the bima, actually just in front of the bima of the of the great synagogue to the community. So this is a place of great cultural significance when it comes to the representing the Jews of the city to uh, to the central the central authorities, but also to themselves. What do they identify with? This is their central symbol, and the very center of the very central very center of that symbol would have been the bima and the Aaron Kodesh. In 2011. This part of the bima was found, this part of the base, which is one of these bases right here. Uh, that was found then, at that time. And we're going to see whether or not we can identify uh, the bima. We identified this particular area of room over here uh, as, the, uh, as the area that the bima could well be located. Uh, we started to excavate in that room, which you can see over here. Demolished, first of all, the walls of the school, took out the floor, I thank the mayor of the mayor of Vilnius for allowing us to do so because that's not something that we take for granted. Uh, and uh, then we started to dig. And unfortunately, here I'm going to have to leave you with a teaser because uh, I can say we have great interesting discoveries, but you're going to have to find about, out about that tomorrow. We're announcing tomorrow what we found. Uh, you're going to have to wait for the press release, which comes out tomorrow. So sorry about that, but you're going to have to wait for that. But it's exciting, and you'll maybe see something kind of finds that we have over there. Uh, the finds are typical finds of the old city. There is nothing that is particularly Jewish about them. They're exactly the same as you would find in many of the other structures within the old city. Many, many, many of these wonderful uh, tiles which come from the stoves, from the heating stoves, uh, molded tiles, with, uh, usually in green but also in blue and white, sometimes in other colors. Lions, eagles, flowers, heraldic symbols on these tiles, and they would have covered the various, uh, the various um, heating elements within the bathhouse and in the house surrounding houses. The quantity of bones is extraordinary, not human bones. Animal bones, many of them show butcher marks that, they, that shows that they come from a, from a butchery in the area. Uh, the, uh, I could say that in general it's beef and goose. They like goose. So uh, lots of goose, lots of geese, uh, lots of lots of beef, a um, bit of chicken. In the first year, we found lots of pig. But we then later understood that was from a house that, which was next door. So I don't know exactly what <laughs> kind of are. Well, and this gives an idea of what they would look like complete. I would suggest anybody who wants to see what these look like complete would make a visit to uh, the archaeological museum, to the Grand uh, the, the Palace of the Grand Duchy. These these are, these are better than the ones we have. Um, but this is the general idea of what they would look like. Okay, we've talked about uh, what we've done this year. Uh, I'll just take. I'll look to just say some words about the possibilities about the, uh, the possibilities of what we can do in the future at the site. Because um, I would say that uh, the site has great significance. That something has to happen. So you could do nothing at all. We could leave it at that end of the scale. But the line of the possibilities go right through this wide range of possibilities from doing nothing all the way to full reconstruction. These are all possibilities, and I think that some of them need to be considered. Uh, of course, this is, this, is, this is doing nothing. We leave the school, and we put up a sign. It's doing nothing. So that's it. We can do it exactly as it is uh, at the moment. Uh, and of course, you can do line reconstructions, which are quite common. But this is one that you, all of you would know, because you, either you walk over it or have uh, seen it, and you can see the line of the uh, of the, of the previous stages of the of the development of the city of Vilnius uh, over time, which are represented by the yellow line, by the red lines in the square. Unfortunately, what often happens is people park their cars over the top of it, and it becomes like that. 
Um, uh, I've done this sort of reconstruction, land reconstruction in Jerusalem. The people who understand it are usually the archaeologists only. Uh, <laughs> that's the problem with it. Um, of course, there's a display of the, uh, of the finds. If this was Israel, that would be no problem. You just have to leave them outside. The weather's nice. Uh, it doesn't rain that often. In the winter, it's sort of warmish. Uh, everything's made of stone, and everything's good. Over here, we're talking about a different kind of climate. Freezing temperatures in winter, which means that ice crystals get into the stone and into the brick. And of course, it's brick. Which means that it would um, crumble. So a linear open like this is not really a possibility. Um, over time, this would all just crumble into dust. And there are some rather interesting examples I've seen wandering around the country. Um, below the Vilnius city wall, for example, is this example, which is an iron grill which shows you the foundation of the city wall. It's in Pelimo Street, those who don't know where it is, uh, and which uh, uh, now has a tree growing out of it. And uh, I think that most people will not be able to see the foundation. So I don't think it's a very good idea. This is a rather interesting example in Carlos, where they use, just next to the rat house. There's a, uh, like a window, an archaeological window. I don't know if you all know it. Um, it looks like that. Generally, it's, it's covered in confetti, because it's the place you get married. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a great solution. And of course, Bilzai is the most interesting solution of all, where you have, it's all been covered by like wooden roofs with, with tiles on top. I don't know if anybody understands what's going on here, but that's the way it's, uh, that's the way it's displayed. Yeah. And just so you don't feel bad, we do it as well. Uh, that's Tunisia, and that's, it, that's London. This is one of the towers of the, um, of the city of London from the Roman period. And this is Pompeii, where sometimes it falls down. And this is Gethsemane in Israel. So we have, we have the same problems. It's not something which is unique uh, to over here. It's a world problem of archaeology. Uh, and of course, you have great sites like this, which is not really the possibility in Lithuania, like uh, Bechan in Israel. Messina in Greece or, or Rome. The architecture here is based on massive stone architecture that is displayed outside. Uh, again, not really the possibilities which are open to you here. One of the things that, that does exist over here also <coughs> is the use of, of mud and mud brick. Uh, Kilnave, not so far from here, 30 kilometers or something, um, where you can see only the hills. You can't really see the archaeology at all. You go there, it's a wonderful site. It's beautiful, but if you want to look at the archaeology, you have to go into the museum over there, and they show you the artifacts. You can't really see the archaeology. What you can see is reconstructions of some of the houses uh, over there. We don't have a situation like Chan Chan where you can keep mud brick outside uh, because you don't have a desert here. So this is all the sort of problems that exist in, uh, with these sorts of sites in Europe and other places in South America. In urban contexts, of course, there have been various attempts to uh, present archaeological finds. Uh, here are just a few examples in Europe, There's one in Israel, uh, one in Paris. The idea over here, of course, is to enclose them inside a building. Uh, that's, that's the way it's been dealt with internationally in many, many places. You can see some, some of the better examples over here. And of course, uh, you've, done, you've done it here. It's the, uh, the, the archaeology here in the Grand Palace, and I'm not going to the reconstruction of the Grand Palace, which I know is incredibly uh, controversial, uh, but the, uh, the archaeological display down below the Grand Palace is extraordinary. It really is world standard, and uh, when people say, what do we have to do? I say, well, you know what to do. You've done it. So uh, you, you know how to display this kind of archaeology. It's been displayed beautifully, and uh, it's, it's a really good display. It doesn't mean the problems all go away. Uh, water is always in the, uh, in the ground. There are always problems of conservation, but basically the display is a good display. No? Then it's not when it's done, when it's done well. There are various um, issues about the ideas of a Jewish cathedral, I, and I haven't really talked about that, but I think that the Vilna synagogue is a Jewish cathedral. It's a main synagogue, not only of the city, but also of the nation. So it's a cathedral building, and that's the way it's got to be uh, related to. There have been various places where cathedral kind of synagogues have been dealt with. Uh, Dresden, for example, where the whole of the city, which was lost during the Second World War and was reconstructed, the only building that was not reconstructed was the synagogue itself. It was built as a square block. Uh, I don't know whether that's suitable. 
uh, in, in Bratislava, not Bratislava, Bratislava, uh, with just a picture of a wall. Uh, in Riga, you have this memorial garden. This is the way they're displayed in those places. And of course, other places, there's been full reconstruction of synagogues. Uh, in Köln, there's a reconstruction of the building. In Zenica, in Berlin, there's a partial reconstruction of the, of the, of the, Neu, of the Neu Synagogue. In Essen, and also in Jerusalem, where the major, the major synagogue of Jerusalem, which was destroyed during the War of Independence, has also been reconstructed uh, on, the, uh, on the basis of the information that was available. And not only, of course, synagogues, other buildings also have been reconstructed. Riga, Dresden, Warsaw, reconstructed the Savior Synagogue, the Savior Church in Moscow, uh, in Munster, and of course, examples which you know closer from home, uh, Trakai, which is a reconstruction, and also uh, the, the, the building of the Grand Duchy. So these are possibilities that exist over here, and this is what we, various possibilities which we presented through time about what to do with it through line, through line reconstruction, which we saw before, display of the remains on the surface. This is one of the uh, processes which has been proposed by Silazak about uh, as a memorial proposal, or, recon or for reconstruction. All these exist as possibilities that the various stakeholders have got to take into account. And the stakeholders are, first and foremost, the people who live here. First and foremost, it's the Lithuanians who live here, who've got to see these bits building as part of their own heritage and part of their own history and part of the development of the city they live in. And, uh, and first and foremost, and also will be the guardians and stewards of the site in the future. So that's the way that they've got to see how what they think about it. And the Jewish community that exists here over here. And I will tell you also, the Jewish community of Litvaks who live outside the country. I think we've also got something to say, and I think we also have a voice within this particular debate. Um, the symbolic value, of just uh, you can see over here, the symbolic value of the various synagogues, and of course, uh, all marked in red, and the cathedrals, one, two, three cathedrals, uh, the Catholic, <coughs> the uh, Orthodox, and the synagogue, the three cathedrals, buildings of the city itself. I put the cathedral in, you saw it. So we three said three, and I put it in. So what can we do? What do I think we can, should we do? First of all, the symbolic, the symbolic place of the great synagogue must be, in my view, returned to the city. Uh, that means doing something which involves, first of all, the display of the archaeology. And I think I've shown you that there is archaeology here of value, which is worth showing to the public. Um, so I think that's the first thing that needs to be done. The second thing that needs to be done is to find some sort of architectural way in, uh, of showing also the Great Synagogue beyond its, uh, just, as a, just as, a, as a sign or even just as an archaeological site with a glass roof over the top of it. I think, it's, I think it has symbolic value and because that symbolic value needs to be represented, there has to be an architectural solution which in some way returns some of the volume of the building to the city. That can be done anything from a partial uh, building of something, full building of something, and the next stage then is finding content. What do you do with that space once you've done something there, whether it is full reconstruction, which you can do in this case because we have full documentation. So you can do full reconstruction because there is full documentation. But you can do something less than that. And the, function, the functions are multiple. The synagogue does not, the, sorry, the city does not need another synagogue as a synagogue. There is one empty synagogue in the city already. We need, uh, the, the city needs something, in my view, which somehow displays what was lost and what needs to be regained in the future. And that needs to be something which is interpretive, something that deals with the history of the site, the culture of the site, the significance of the site. And that's what needs to be, in my view, uh, placed over there. The, music, the, the uh, content can be a multiple function kind of, some, uh, of, of from a museum in the polling kind of model which displays something about the life of Lita, uh, the life of Lithuania, the Jewish life of Lithuania, to something which also talks about the Jewish life within the city. So those are the sort of uh, directions which I think we should be going in the future and uh, I very much hope. And I see from uh, discussions with the mayor and with uh, the Jewish community and with other people that we're, things are moving. Things are starting to shift, and uh, I, think we're in, I think we're working in the right direction, and hopefully we will find uh, some success in this in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you.
exams for each and every part of your presentation. All, all of them were very, very interesting, informative, and inspiring. The interpretive one was mostly inspiring. So I believe there are questions and comments, and well, that's why we are here. We could find things which are broken, but the building was demolished by bulldozing uh, down to the level of the ground. So the, the synagogue itself, is, you could say we have the bottom 1 meter, 80, 2 meters of the building, and the rest of it is lost. We have pieces of the ceiling and on the floor, we have pieces of the, of, of the walls on the floor, but to find much, anything much higher than that would be unlikely. You must also remember the building was stood <coughs> empty for 14 years. From, 1940, from 1941, all the way up until uh, 1957, 1957. So it, was, it, stood, uh, it stood empty, so that during that period, and it was burnt also. So it was burnt, it was ransacked, and then it stood open to the elements for 14 years. The likelihood of finding any, any artifact within the structure is quite low. Uh, the very important artifacts, like, uh, for example, the, uh, the doors of the Aron Kodesh and the Magen, uh, were taken to the museum. Actually, I recently found a photograph of my great uncle looking, looking for someone in the field. Uh, uh, with, uh, but, uh, so, and, and, uh, so that was taken to the museum. Uh, the other, uh, this, the, 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 uh, the Torah scrolls were reburied in 1945. That's when uh, 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 Torasco, which goes out of use, uh, is put in a Geniza, which is uh, or its place, or it's buried by the human. And in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cemetery, they were buried in 1945. So the likelihood of, uh, of finding anything within it, I would say, is quite low. And what the deepest part? The deepest thing, uh, deepest well, maybe we can find the foundations, but um, you know, you never know, it's archaeology, that's the fun. The fun of it is finding <laughs> things you don't, uh, you don't expect. So, yeah, it's not possible. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything on the color scheme of the interior? Yeah, I talked about, the very start, I talked about Chagall at the very beginning. I missed that. Oh, okay. Uh, Chagall, um, I don't have, I have it somewhere, I don't know. Uh, but um, <coughs> Chagall did a painting in the uh, 1920s, 1924, if I remember, uh, when he visited the city and he painted. Two paintings within 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 the shulhoi. One of the uh, of the cloys of the Beit Midrash, the set of the prayer hall of the of the of the Gaon, and the other one was of the interior of the great synagogue. That shows the color scheme inside. Um, uh, it shows the color scheme of the bima and of the Oran Kodesh and of the the trust, the uh, stained glass windows, which stood at the back of the at the back of the synagogue. Uh, not, nothing spectacular, just sort of colored glass, but, uh, but that, that, see, he gives good documentary information about that. The other thing is worth looking at is a building which is not a, which is the church on the other side of the street, in the, uh, the German church. The German church has many, many elements which are identical to the elements within the, uh, within the Great Synagogue. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the church, the, uh, the Protestant Lutheran church, and the synagogue were built probably by the same architect at the same time. Uh, the, uh, there is a great likelihood that some of the color scheme inside the building would be similar to the uh, to Lutheran church, especially the ceiling, which is um, which is um, which is blue and white, and that would be very suitable also for the synagogue. It shows, of course, the, the heavens. So, uh, yeah, possibly that. Yeah. We, we do talk about the, the politics. Uh, or politics of the excavation projects over the years. Do I have to? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I want to. <laughs> is, is there a story there? That we uh, there's always stories, but uh, I don't think it actually helps in any way particularly. It's, uh, the thing is, is whether we're moving in the right direction. And I think we are moving in the right direction. Uh, I think there's a bit, there's a bit, there's, great, uh, there's greater understanding in the city for the needs of preservation of Jewish sites. Um, We've seen, we see it also in the cemetery, for example, where the cemetery is being cleared and the stones have been collected and they're going to be placed in some sort of memorial. So that, 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 that direction is a direction which is a positive direction. 
and I think we should look at the positive rather than the, some of the negative qualities. Yeah. Can I ask you something? Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you for your presentation and for the wonderful job you're doing here. But well, are you planning to, to go on with the archaeological research? Are you coming back next year? And uh, do you already have some concrete plans? What, what elements are you planning to, to yeah. research? Um, concrete plans are always based on concrete budgets. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea, of course, is to come back again next year. And I think that if, if, if I think we've shown that we were sponsored this year by the uh, Goodwill Foundation of the, of the uh, Jewish community. I think they've seen the results of this year are the sort of results they would like to have. And I very much hope that next year we also receive uh, money from the, from the Google Foundation. I also think that we also need to see money coming also from uh, central government or municipal funds. I think that's certainly talking about the politics of it. That's certainly something which I think is an essential part of the future of the way it has to be dealt with in the future. So the answer is yes. How long could you work until it's finished? Or can it be finished at all? I don't know if it's true. Um, it depends again, it goes back to the question of budgets. If we have big budgets, we can go quickly. If we have small budgets, we go slowly. That's, that's quite, it's very simple. Because we have to pay work. Everything is done. When, yeah. I mean, when everything is excavated, investigated, yeah. recorded. And well, it also involves, it involves two stages. It involves the, 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 the resources that we have to do the excavation. It also involves the next stage, and the next stage is the preservation and, present, present, preservation and the presentation phase that has to be integrated, and uh, it has to be integrated, I would say, pretty soon. We're at the stage now where we have to start thinking about how the place needs to be presented in the future. We have enough information for the architects to start thinking about it. So I think uh, that, that needs to come together, otherwise we have to, like we do every year, cover it again with the earth, and then open it again the next year. And uh, that, first of all, is a waste of time and a waste of resources. And uh, so we've got to start moving into that phase. How long that takes depends totally on the resources available and decision, and political decisions. Is, yeah. is there political support for a reconstructed visual? Some people support that idea, yeah. uh, There is some that support that, some people do not. It's a mixture. You go from the whole, the whole range of systems. And you said you have like full documentation. What, what kind of documents? That you can't. When, when we talk about uh, when we talk about the Grand Duchy Palace, there was a problem, for example, that it was a building which was destroyed much before full documentation was available. So the, the question there was, what do you then present to the public as a building? What the information you can use to present the building? What stage of the building do you do present? And this involves the conventions of, of the conventions, the internationally accepted conventions. Uh, about um, about we, about uh, our heritage, uh, so that's where it gets controversial. There are many many examples in the last number of years where the full reconstruction has been done. For example, the uh, the Soviet Soviet Church in Moscow, which was also done. Full documentation was available. Mm -hmm. That means there were full pictures, etc. Uh, etc. Et on the other hand, the building was reconstructed in concrete rather than using original materials. So there are all problems of authenticity. Uh, and which come into, the, into this, into this uh, uh, kind of discussion. There are many places where reconstruction has been done uh, and they later become UNESCO sites. For example, Warsaw is fully reconstructed, uh, but it has become a World Heritage Site even though it was fully reconstructed. So there are many, many problems and many, many exceptions to the rules. I would say the rules of the last years have become a little bit more tolerant of the idea of reconstruction of buildings of this kind. Uh, but it has to be based on full documentation. And full documentation means that we have thousands of pictures, we have plans, we have now the excavations, we have artifacts, we have a lot of, a lot of information that makes the possibility, if that's the road that we want to go down, of reconstruction of the Great Synagogue, a, a, feasible, a feasible project. Um, that can be done. We, we think it can be done, it can be justified as well as I do. Uh, so that, that's a possibility that exists, and that's one of the possibilities that I think has to be brought to this. Just a small question. We saw today the artifact that you got out, so I understand you cover the ground, but what happens to those from the end to the end? I don't understand, sorry. Uh, the pieces we saw today at the yeah. site, what happens to those pieces from year to year? Wh which pieces? What? Do you mean the, the artifacts or do you mean the pieces yeah. of the building? No, no, the artifacts. Yeah. The artifacts are stored in the Jewish Museum. 
that fact, all, the, all the pottery and things like that yeah, yeah. is stored in the, in, in the warehouse of the Jewish Museum. The bonds. Everything. Everything. And we also, the bricks also are there. <coughs> we will be the bricks. Okay. So we have the Lithuanian counterpart of the excavation, maybe Christina's, maybe Christina has something to add. Uh, I think everything is pretty much summed up about this situation for this year. Uh, I think there, there's cooperation for the next two years at least. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> do you have your visions? What should be done? How it should be presented in the uh, world? I think the, the John presented very well the, all those possibilities that can be, and I, I think there's ways that, uh, that, that are the ways that should be presented that somebody has to choose this because this is not us who make decisions we can suggest one thought that we want this, we want that but uh, we are not making the decisions So who are the main stakeholders? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the municipality mm -hmm. I mean the Jewish community and we have, who else is stakeholders? I would say that the stakeholders of the wider Jewish world uh, these are all the major stakeholders, of course, NGOs and uh, the public. These are the stakeholders. Yeah, everybody is a, he's a stakeholder. Uh, they're, they're, they're the stakeholders, and we have decision makers. You know, decision makers, obviously, is in the end is municipality and government, obviously. That's the end. So, before the reconstruction of the palace of the rulers, uh, of the great duchy, as you call it, so there was a huge discussion and a huge fight about it. So, do you first do you anticipate this kind of discussion to take place here about the Great Synod of Two? Or? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it should be inspired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the discussion is good. That means that there's a little bit of open debate, which of course is mm -hmm. good. Yeah, that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And since there might be an open debate, I mean, do you see any process that would lead to consensus? Well, in the end, in the, end uh, the decisions are made by somebody in the end. That's the way the, the academic, that's the, way the democratic process works. Somebody makes a decision in the end of the process. So you have a consultation and you have a decision. There has to be somebody who ultimately makes that decision. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not totally up on the, uh, on, the, on the planning and the building process in Lithuania, but uh, that's, the, that's the person who, the people at the, head of, at the top of that, of that uh, process will have to be the people making the decisions in the end. In the, in the, in the interim, there's lots of place for all sorts of people to provide their opinion. But that's the way it should be done. I hope it will not be a building department, you know, because... In the end, in the end, that's what, in the end it comes down to a building department. Something to build a building, you right? know? That's, yeah, that's what happens in the end. What can you do about it? Yeah. Well, the palace of the Grand Duchess, it was built without permission, actually. Okay. So then just, maybe just I, don't, to, I don't run the process To remind us of our exceptions. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, since the is the World Heritage Site, at least partially old town, would yeah. this be a natural part of the World Heritage, 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 Heritage Site? If you look, if you look at, the world, at, the, at the declaration of the old city of, of Vilnius yeah. as a World Heritage Site, even though the place of the Jewish population within, that, uh, within the old city was, was central to the life of the old city, it's hardly mentioned in the declaration. There is, a, I think it actually says, that the uh, synagogue is represented by its empty space. Uh, if I remember the exact, the exact wording which appears in the, in the declaration, I don't think any of us wants to be an empty space. Um, so um, I think I, 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 you know, that, 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 that's, quite a, that's quite a difficult sentence to swallow. So I think, um, yeah, certainly, and, and certainly I think, that's, I think this is an addition to the, uh, the, old, city, uh, the old city declaration of the world, as a city of world heritage value. Uh, which is an essential part of it. Um, and I hope that people in the city agree with that. I mean, certainly uh, when I talk to uh, the head of the development agency, then uh, that's also his view as well. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there's definitely a place to work on that. So, yeah, good green. Thank you. <coughs>
since the official part is over, if you accept informal okay. conversations, uh, somebody maybe wants to, well, to give a question which uh, did not uh, dare to ask openly. So you can. <laughs>